Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Washington Kurdish Institute. My name is Philip Kowalski, joining you from Washington, D.C. I'm a Middle East fellow at Young Professionals in Foreign Policy, that's YPFP, and a friend of the Washington Kurdish Institute. Today's webinar is dedicated to Dr. Naj Najmaldin Karim. As you all hopefully know by now, this is our ninth webinar, but sadly the first after the passing of Dr. Karim, who is a tireless Kurdish leader and the founder of the Washington Kurdish Institute. While we are still devastated by this great loss, we are happy to announce that the work of the Washington Kurdish Institute will continue like before, if not more. Dr. Karim's leadership, wisdom, and patriotism will continue to enlighten our path towards the future. Today, we'll be discussing President-elect Joe Biden. Joe Biden will enter office with the most notable pro-Kurdish record of any previous American president. He was the first American politician to visit a Kurdish region, Iraqi Kurdistan, in 2002, where he spoke to the parliament and gave his pledge for American support to the Kurdish cause. His efforts in Iraq were integral to the formation of the modern KRG, while his advocacy for Syrian Kurds was essential in shaping American policy towards Syria. Biden also made defense of the Kurds a key part of his foreign policy platform in the recent presidential election. Under President Trump, though, the United States notably scaled back its pro-Kurdish policies. It sat by idly during the 2017 independence referendum when Baghdad and Iran invaded Kirkuk and other Kurdish-majority provinces. In October of 2019, Trump gave Erdogan a green light to invade Kurdish-held northern Syria, resulting in an ongoing humanitarian crisis while provoking significant bipartisan backlash within the United States, catching the wide attention of an American public that usually ignores foreign policy decisions. While we have good reason to expect Biden will continue his pro-Kurdish outlook, we must also look at real politics and ask, will a Biden presidency simply opt to return to the pre-Trump status quo? Will his office seek to further advocate for the Kurdish community? Some are not so convinced that Biden has true ideological, ideological commitments for foreign policy. Corey Shaki of, of the American Enterprise Institute wrote this summer that Joe Biden has been wrong a lot on foreign policy and defense policy. A lot. This year's presumptive Democratic presidential nominee voted against the 1991 Gulf War, in which the United States and a broad multinational coalition quickly achieved their goals, and in favor of the 2003 Iraq War, and regretted both votes. Years in hostilities, he opposed the troop surges that brought some stability to both Iraq and Afghanistan, and he insisted that the Taliban per se is not our enemy. He argued for carving Iraq into sectarian statelets, and even as Iraqis voted, for cross-sectarian political lists, and he opposed the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. These stanzas suggest not only that he lacks a philosophy of how to use foreign military force effectively, but also that his instincts on when to use it are often faulty. So which Biden will we see? There is much for Biden to fix in the next four years. How he chooses to go forward with his Kurdish policy will have profound ramifications for Washington's Middle East policy. Indeed, one could make the argument that Washington's Kurdish policy will be a microcosm of how its worldwide foreign policy will move forward from the Trump era. The Kurdish cause has never been more popular among the American public. Will the next four years choose to be a definitive moment in the history of Kurdistan? To discuss this question, we have three wonderful speakers joining us today. We have first, Dr. David Romano, a Thomas G. Strong professor of Middle East politics at Missouri State University. He has authored numerous publications on the Kurds and the Middle East, including two books. His research interests cover nationalism, social movements, theories of peace and conflict, political violence, politicized Islam, Middle East, and Mediterranean politics, with a special emphasis on Turkey, Iraq, the Kurds, and other Middle Eastern minorities, and foreign policy. Dr. Romano was a Rudal columnist from 2010 to 2020. We also have Dr. Amy Austin Holmes with, with us, currently a visiting scholar at the Middle East Initiative of Harvard University, a fellow at the Wilson Center, an international affairs fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations while on leave from her tenured position at the American University of Cairo. She has a PhD from John Hopkins University. A former Fulbright scholar in Germany, she is the author of Coups and Revolutions, Mass Mobilization, the Egyptian Military, and the United States from Mubarak to Sisi, and Social Unrest in American Military Bases in Turkey and Germany since 1945. Having spent a decade living in the Middle East through the period known as the Arab Spring, 
She has published numerous articles on Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Tunisia, and Bahrain. Professor Holmes is the first person to have conducted a field survey of the Syrian Democratic Forces based on numerous trips to all six provinces of Northeast Syria between 2015 and 2019. Her current research is about the governance challenges of semi-autonomous Kurdish-led region of Northern Syria. This includes a focus on the protection of minority groups as well. And finally, we have Dr. Mehmed Gursis, a professor of political science at Florida Atlantic University. His research interests include ethnic and religious conflict, post-Civil War peace building, post-Civil War democratization, and Kurdish politics. He is the author of Anatomy of a Civil War, Sociopolitical Impacts of the Kurdish Conflict in Turkey, and co-editor of Conflict, Democratization, and the Kurds in the Middle East. And finally, The Kurds in the Middle East, Enduring Problems and Dynamics. He has published extensively in journals, including International Interactions, Social Sciences Quarterly, Defense and Peace Economics, International Studies Perspectives, Party Politics, Conflict Management and Peace Science, Political Research Quarterly, and Comparative Politics. So with that said, I'm ready to ask a few questions to our guests today. And um, starting with David, I would like you to, if you could, please briefly go over Biden's previous Kurdish policy and what you expect, so what sort of stance Biden will take um, during his four years as president. Uh, th thank you, Philip, and uh, thank you um, to the Washington Kurdish Institute for having me. Um, I'm, it's difficult for me to predict what, what the policy is gonna be before we see all the places, uh, all the names in place uh, for who's going to be uh, formulating it. But I, I, I wanna say a lot about what I think it sh should realistically be and, and what it, it could be w within the realm of, of possibility. Uh, so that means that US policy under Biden is gonna have a view towards US interests, but there's a lot of leeway and, and variance in how US interests can be interpreted and viewed, right? Uh, and, and so what you can go from like a Kissinger type, brutal, real politic <laughs> type conception of US interests to a, a, a view of uh, human rights and collective security principles and multilateralism as be also being good for US interests. Now, usually there's a mix of the two. Uh, it, it's not that common that we experience uh, extremes such as the uh, Trump or Nixon administrations. Usually we see a, a, a combination in, in how uh, the U.S. interests are viewed. And so when we look at Iran and Iraq and the, the, the Kurds and, and Biden's policy there, um, I, I want to talk about Iran first. Uh, Biden will want to renew the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, AKA the Iran nuclear accord. Um, that's fine. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons why uh, that bad deal is better than worse options. Uh, but in renewing the deal, uh, Biden needs to avoid repeating mistakes that John Kerry and the administration, Obama administration of which he was a part made when they originally negotiated the deal. Uh, now, obviously, any possible deal to limit Iran's nuclear weapon uh, capacity has to be limited to that issue. Uh, critics of the obama Kerry era deal were, as my mother would say, uh, kind of dreaming in color. Uh, she used to tell me, uh, tu rêves en couleur, you, you dream in color, like forget about it, right? So they were dreaming in color when they said the Iran nuclear deal needed to include uh, issues not related to nuclear weapons and, and enrichment, such as Iran's conventional military capabilities, support for groups like Hezbollah and so forth. The deal can't include stuff like that. It wouldn't have been possible. So they needed to remain separate. But the problem is that while Iran separated these issues when negotiating the nuclear deal with the Obama administration and would not concede to any notion of including uh, non-nuclear related conditions in the deal, the Obama administration, which included Biden, acted as if other issues were indeed linked, acted as if they were linked in a way that favored Iran. What I mean by this is that they treated Iran sort of like a, a deer that might get spooked if they said anything about human rights in Iran, if they pressured Iran in other venues and so forth. 
And uh, this even went to the point where during the negotiations, uh, Obama canceled a major uh, drug enforcement agency, DEA investigation into Hezbollah drug running and money laundering. Uh, and and, and that those Hezbollah operations include use, included using car dealers in the US to launder money. And he, he, he nixed that investigation lest the Iranians get spooked and back away from the deal. Now that's nonsense. It's a recipe for the Iranians to walk all over the US in negotiations. Um, and it rightly worried US allies in the region, which in includes uh, some, some Kurdish groups as well. The much better approach would be for the US to really separate nuclear issues from other issues, just like the Iranians did and, and demanded. Now that means, sure, negotiate a return to the nuclear deal but keep opposing and pressuring Iran in other venues, just like they will keep opposing and harming the US. So now what does that mean in practice, especially for the Kurds? Uh, I should think that means things like holding talks with legitimate Iranian Kurdish opposition groups uh, and other op Iranian opposition groups. Um, uh, I'm not so sure about the Mujahideen al Kalk, but there, there's plenty of other good options. It means things like speaking up loudly about Iranian human rights abuses and, and sanctioning them for such. It means things like uh, helping US allies and not just states that are facing Iranian pressure or attacks. Now, hopefully Biden is familiar enough with the region and with the Kurds to know this. Uh, working with Iran on a resumption of the nuclear accord while working against Iran in other contexts should also help assuage regional allies like Israel and Saudi Arabia, and perhaps even some Biden critics in the US. Now on the other side, various uh, Iranian Kurdish political parties um, need to most of all unify and speak with more of one voice. That's always the problem on the Kurdish side, it seems. Um, but if they continue spending half or more of their time criticizing each other, the Iranian Kurdish opposition groups, rather than the mullahs in Iran, it's hard for a Biden administration or anyone else to take them seriously. Now, for Iraq and uh, Bashul, so we just spoke, I just said a few comments about Iran and Rojalat, but for Iraq and Bashul, uh, I'm not sure if the way forward is clear. Most of all, a new Biden administration needs to pay attention and keep better channels of communication with the KRG always open asking them what they need, amongst other things, and considering these requests. Uh, in 2017, the big sins of the Trump administration uh, were to first ignore developments in Iraqi Kurdistan, and that was a bit the sin of the Obama administration before him. You know, didn't want to hear about Iraq. Uh, so the first thing was to ignore developments in Iraqi Kurdistan, and then once they couldn't ignore them any longer, to not just stay neutral, but to declare the Seven, September 2017 referendum illegitimate, for instance, uh, which gave a clear green light for others to attack the Iraqi Kurds. Now, once the October 2017 attack on Kirkuk occurred, then the US decided to stay neutral in a conflict that pitted reliable Iraqi Kurdish allies against Tehran, Baghdad, and their US armed Shiite militias. The results were a huge setback for pro-US Kurds and a win for Iran. Now, I suspect at least behind closed doors, the US in October 2017 did warn Baghdad against continuing their attacks into recognized parts of autonomous Kurdistan, as opposed to uh, disputed territories like uh, Kirkuk. Uh, now, an alternate scenario uh, back then in 2017 would have had a, a clear American warning against attacking Iraqi Kurds and to demand that Erbil and Baghdad together enact Article 140 of the Iraqi Constitution, as opposed to unilateral grabs of disputed territories by either side. And that could have gone some way to resolving things more productively. Now today, uh, after Biden uh, takes office in January, um, getting a resolution to the Erbil-Baghdad budget disputes should be a real priority for the Biden administration helping with that. Uh, Kurdistan used to be the other Iraq uh, and one of the only bright spots following the 2003 invasion. But all that progress is threatened by economic collapse now. The Biden administration must not repeat mistakes of the Trump and Obama ones, 
by only paying attention to Iraq when too many things start blowing up. Now on the Kurdish side in Iraq, the same issue as always, the same issue as with Iran, the lack of a unified voice, democratic backsliding by the KDP and PUK, uh, who still have most of the Peshmerga answering to their respective parties rather than to the Kurdistan regional government, uh, corruption problems and neo-patrimonial family politics. These things all make it a lot harder for any outside actors, the US included, as well as the EU and others, to take the KRG seriously. Now, this is despite all the real and great accomplishments that the KRG can and should be proud of. Uh, unfortunately, some uh, Western professional critics of the KRG, as well as uh, opposition parties in the Kurdistan region that aren't always completely responsible, they regularly take these problems and exaggerate them by several orders of magnitude. And policy people in Washington um, listen to this a lot, and it hurts the region. Uh, now, finally, I would like to add one more thing about that the Biden administration should consider doing, and uh, they should set up State Department and other offices whose mandate focuses only on the Kurds. Currently, Washington's bureaucratic working groups are always set up along state lines, like the State Department group for Turkey or the CIA group for Turkey, uh, the other one for Iran, the other one for Iraq, for Syria. And uh, as a result of that, uh, they always view the Kurdish issue through very state-centric uh, lenses, and they often fail to understand what's really happening or needs to happen in Kurdish regions. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, I would just like to, before we move on to the next question, I would just like to remind the audience that if they have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A section, and we will answer those questions in the last 30 minutes of this session. Uh, moving on to Amy now, I was wondering if you could discuss Biden's uh, Syrian Kurdish policy uh, in the past and what we can expect moving forward. Sure. All right. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me to speak today on this important issue. Uh, so I want to lay out what I think is um, one of the most, uh, you know, that, that the Kurdish issue, let's call it that for now, the Kurdish issue, um, it's actually one of the largest conflicts in the Middle East, just in terms of population size alone. And I think many people who focus on the Middle East, they still don't actually realize the size and the complexity of, of the problem. Um, it's also one of the most protracted armed conflicts in the world with Kurdish insurgencies dating back uh, over a century. So way before the PKK was even founded, uh, there were Kurdish insurgencies in the 19th century in all four countries where you have Kurdish minorities. And yet, despite its constancy, um, the Kurdish issue has never received the attention that it deserves from any administration, not from the Trump administration, not from Obama, not from any administration. And under Trump in particular, um, U.S. policy was skewed towards Turkey. Um, this continued even after Michael Flynn uh, was removed as national security advisor after revelations of his ties to Turkish officials. And this resulted really in disastrous foreign policies in Syria, which undermined U.S. national security interests. It was often discussed in the media as the U.S. betraying the Kurds when uh, Trump ordered the withdrawal uh, in October 2019. But to refer to it as you know, a betrayal of Kurds actually minimizes the issue. It makes the issue appear smaller than in fact it is. Um, because this U.S. withdrawal from Syria in October 2019 uh, was a gift to Bashar al-Assad and Putin and Tehran. Um, and so it was actually in violation of the U.S. Uh, national security policies. This is Go on. believe that finding, finding a resolution to this, let's call it Kurdish you know, issue, should be a priority for the Biden administration. Um, to his credit, President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Erdogan himself recognized that there was no military solution to this problem, that a political settlement was needed, and Erdogan himself oversaw negotiations with the PKK between 2012 and 2015. However, very soon, often imme uh, immediately after those peace talks broke down, 
the Turkish military stepped up their interventions in both Syria and Iraq, as well as operations inside Turkey. And as a result of this, hundreds of thousands of Syrian civilians were forcibly displaced. The majority of them were actually Arabs, Arab civilians, as well as um, Yazidis, Assyrians, Armenians, Syriac Christians, um, and Kurds, of course. In the Kurdistan region of Iraq, hundreds of villages have been effectively depopulated because of the recurrent conflict uh, in the border areas. And even Sinjar, the ancestral homeland of the Yazidis, which is very far away from the Turkish border, has been hit by Turkish airstrikes. And so this is no longer a small insurgency. This is no longer a civil war that is confined to the Turkish military and the PKK. This conflict affects virtually all of the religious and ethnic groups in the region, in Turkey, in Northern Syria, and in Northern Iraq. And so if the Biden administration would make finding a resolution to this conflict a priority, it could be the key to unlocking a number of interrelated challenges. Um, and I believe the Biden administration should convene a coalition of diverse stakeholders uh, to mediate this conflict, similar to the global coalition that was also assembled under American leadership, which successfully defeated the Islamic State. Now, of course, this coalition wouldn't have to include, you know, 79 members, but it's more than just a conflict, as I said, between Turkey and the PKK. It does not only involve, uh, you know, those four countries, but there are many diverse stakeholders that I think have a keen interest in resolving this conflict. Um, and just as Turkey came to accept and even profit from trade relations with the Kurdistan region of Iraq, Turkish entrepreneurs could handsomely benefit from the reconstruction of Northeast Syria. And Northeast Syria is in desperate need of reconstruction. Um, roads need to be built, schools need to be built, hospitals need to be built. Um, you know, if anyone who's ever visited this region, Raqqa, for example, the Azor, these areas still lie for the most part in rubble for years. And it is a security threat that we allow Raqqa to continue and did Azor to continue, that the people there have to continue living amongst the rubble. Um, you know, they need to have, be able to rebuild their lives. And so um, rebuilding Northeast Syria should be a, a priority. And there are Turkish entrepreneurs uh, who could handsomely benefit from this. Uh, so there is a constituency within Turkey who also has an interest in this. Um, and, you know, our Kurdish, uh, partners in, in Northeast Syria, I think will, will look to us for, for leadership. Um, and so a peaceful resolution to this conflict would not only, and again, it's a Turkish, Kurdish, Syrian, Iraqi conflict, not just, you know, Turkish PKK conflict. Uh, this would also, I believe, potentially open the door to greater political pluralism in all of these countries, in Turkey, in Northeast Syria, and also in, in Iraq and the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, this would help ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS, not the temporary defeat, but the in, in, enduring defeat of ISIS. And it would potentially set the groundwork for real economic development um, in, in Northeast Syria. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, it would also allow that these endangered religious minorities, in particular Yazidis and Assyrian, Syriac, Armenian Christians, who've inhabited this region for millennia, that they would be able to continue to survive in their homelands because they have actually been some of the first targets. When the Islamic State attacked, uh, would, would take control of a region in Syria, let's say, one of the first things they did was to attack Yazidis and Christians and also to issue fatwas to regulate uh, women's behavior. When the Turkish-backed militias attacked Afrin or uh, Ras al Ain, Serekani, Tel Abyad, also one of the first things they did was to dismantle the gender egalitarian structures that have been set up by the autonomous administration to physically attack women, in particular uh, Hevrin Halat, who was assassinated by Turkish backed rebels, and also to target Christians and Yazidis. Now, I am not suggesting that 
you know, there is an equivalency between ISIS and uh, the so-called Syrian National Army or these Turkish-backed rebels that are now occupying Afrin and Sadekani, Ras al Ain. But it is empirically a fact that that is one of their priorities, to attack women, dismantle the gender egalitarian structures, and also to attack the Christians and Yazidis. When I was in Syria in September, I spoke to many Yazidis who were forcibly displaced from Sadekani, who cannot go back. I talked to Christians who were forcibly displaced from uh, Sadekani, and they told me that when those rebel groups came in, one of the first things they did was to go to the churches and to shut off the generators in, of the churches in, in uh, Sadekani. And um, there are, I have been told, no uh, Syriac or Assyrian pastors left in Sadekani. And, and so what we're, what we're witnessing is an ethnic cleansing of Yazidis and Christians from regions that they've inhabited for centuries. And this could happen in our lifetime, on our watch, if no action is taken by the Biden administration. And this is why I would urge that this should be a top priority within the first 100, 100 days of, of the Biden administration taking office. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, Mehmet, we'd like to move on to you now. If you could discuss uh, Biden and Turkey and the Kurds. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you, Philip, and thank you for having me. Um, I also would like to start off with a general overview of the changing Middle East. And I think, uh, as the previous speakers, Dr. Romano and Dr. Holmes, already pointed out, uh, no matter what part of Kurdish territories or Kurdistan you talk about, whether it is the Kurdish question in Turkey, in Syria, Iraq, or Iran, uh, the, 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 the size of the Kurdish lands and the size of the Kurdish people and the division of them between, uh, between these four major Middle Eastern countries, I think it makes it not just a Turkish problem, not just a Syrian, Iranian, or Iraqi problem. Uh, this is at the very least, a regional problem. And I think uh, in order to make sense of what can be done and what cannot be done, I would like to make an argument for uh, the fact that the Middle East uh, has undergone some fundamental changes. And I think one of the best examples that I have come up with so far is uh, if you ask a Sunni Arab man or woman, and if you ask them whether they would like to live in Syria in Yemen, in Libya, or in the West Bank as of today? The obvious answer would probably be they, as a Sunni Arab man or woman, would prefer to live in the West Bank. If you ask them the same question 10 or 15 years ago, uh, that West Bank may not have been the obvious choice because uh, in the last 10 years or so, the changes that the Middle East has undergone has turned the West Bank into one of the safest places in the Middle East, which is an irony, given the history of the Palestinian conflict and given the fact that uh, Westerners especially and Middle Easterners as well, uh, we were used to talk about violence in the West Bank, violence uh, between Israelis and, and, and Palestinians, et cetera. That's no longer the case. So uh, as of today, if the West Bank has become safer than Yemen, safer than Libya, safer than Syria. Uh, that tells us something very important about the new Middle East and looking at the number of people that live under the rule of uh, non-state armed action factions. So from Syria to Iraq, to Yemen, to Libya, we are looking at about 100 million people that does not have access to a functioning government. Again, 10, 15 years ago, that was not necessarily the case. There were a number of weak states back then, but there were not failed states here and there. Uh, so I think when we talk about uh, the, the Kurdish conflict, the Kurdish issue in Turkey or in Syria or in Iraq, they are all interrelated to one another. And this is not necessarily a question or a problem that the Kurds themselves can resolve it because it relates to uh, both uh, regional and global powers. Uh, it has a lot to do with um, two visions, Islamism fighting secular groups in the Middle East. And uh, with the only exception of the Kurdish groups in 
uh, Syria and Iraq, and, and you could actually extend the list to Iran and, and Turkey as well. There are no other secular groups left in the Middle East. So we are essentially looking at Islamism uh, versus another form of Islamism. So we are either looking at the Shiite Islamism competing with Sunni Islamism, and we have the Kurds in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere. These are the secular groups that are more than willing and uh, moderately able to actually work with the West to not only stabilize, also secularize the region. I'm not saying them democratizing it yet because democracy will uh, take much longer time uh, than just a few years of investing in this. But we must first stabilize and secularize both Syria, Iraq, and Turkey. And then hopefully we can build on this to democratize the region uh, in the long term. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, the Biden administration can or cannot do, and I would like to recognize that there are limits to what the Biden administration can do and cannot do. This is a fundamentally changed region, and this is a very complex situation we are facing. I think the first thing the Biden administration should and could do would be, as was mentioned earlier, to listen. Uh, that was not what the Trump administration did in the last four years. Uh, and given the experience of President-elect Joe Biden, I think he has more than enough experience, more than enough wisdom, and, and some willingness to actually listen to different factions, different groups in the Middle East, and try to mediate the conflict between uh, the Kurds and, and the Turkish state or the Syrian state or the, the Iraqi and the Iranian state. When it I think when it comes to the, the Kurdish conflict in Syria, even the conflict or the tensions between the PKK and the KRG in the last month or so, uh, we, we must recognize that when it comes to the Kurdish issue in Turkey and primarily in Syria and to an extent in Iraq and, and Iran, uh, the, the real dominant group is the PKK. And without making peace, uh, with this dominant group without actually, and the other obviously uh, elephant in the room is a Turkish state. Without Turkey uh, making peace or coming to the negotiating tables with the PKK or the PKK uh, related groups in the Middle East, uh, the conflict in Syria, the tensions in Iraq are not really likely to end. And some commentators I hear and there sometimes they would talk about, okay, let's ask the Syrian Kurds to forget about the Kurds in Turkey. This is simply historically uh, not realistic thing to, uh, to propose because the historical, cultural, linguistic and political uh, relationship between the Kurds in Syria and the Kurds in Turkey, more so than the Kurds in Turkey and Iraq, it makes it almost impossible for these two people that should just forget about one another. And I think uh, the, the conflict in Syria, unless it is resolved, will keep feeding the conflict in Turkey and the conflict in Turkey will keep feeding the conflict in Syria and Iraq as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think President-elect Joe Biden um, at the very least he probably would be more, more willing to listen. Uh, this would be a great start. Uh, and other things I think that Biden administration must do to move away from a foreign policy towards the Middle East that is entirely transactional. The United States, at least, uh, I would like to think that the United States is more than just oil. Of course, oil is important economic and financial resources. It is part of American uh, national interest. I'm not denying that, but the United States should and must uh, stand up for certain values that we have taken for granted so far. Human rights, democracy, equality, gender equality, among others. If we're all about protecting oil in their resort in Kamishlu, 
then the United States will lose this game in the long run. If we are all about let them figure it out, then they are not going to figure it out. It's going to be Russia, it's going to be Turkey, and it's going to be Iran that will fill the vacuum. Uh, another uh, important issue that I would like to emphasize is um, the Biden administration, I think, must work really hard to prevent the Kurdish conflict turning into another Palestinian conflict in the Middle East. Now, the Palestinian conflict is still unresolved. Uh, it has been going on for about a century now. And the way uh, the Trump administration at least gave a green light to the Russians, to the Syrians, to the Turks, to advance their own territorial and political interest, it is increasingly turning the Kurdish lands into fragmented uh, piece of pockets of resistance. And that is, I don't think the, 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 the new American administration would like to see five or six other Gazas in the Middle East. So uh, as the Turkish army is uh, penetrating into Northern Syria, uh, the Turkish army is penetrating in Northern Iraq, it's not only destabilizing these parts of the Middle East, it's also potentially creating new Gazas. And I'm not sure if the Middle East can actually um, absorb uh, several other Gaza as pockets of conflict that can explode and implode any time in the long run. Uh, so I think when we talk about uh, President Joe Biden's policy, I'm not sure if we actually need uh, a very uh, elaborate, coherent uh, foreign policy in the long run. I mean, obviously having such a policy would be wonderful, but given the complications involved, I think wait and see seems to be um, a big part of the policy, uh, both it, during the Obama administration. The Obama administration primarily was defined by uh, when it came to the Middle East, what we did not want to see it was not a proactive policy. And I'm hoping that uh, the new American administration will uh, move beyond just wait and see and become more proactive. Nonetheless, even wait and see may not be a great policy. Wait and see still is a much better policy than tweeting about the Middle East at 3 a.m. So, uh, it, when it comes to the curse in Turkey and in Syria, I think the best thing that we can all hope for would be that the new administration um, encourage uh, the, the parties involved, primarily the Turkish government, the Kurdish groups in Turkey, as well as in Syria, uh, to, to reach a political solution. And I think we all have seen this going on for at least 30 or 40 years. No one is benefiting from the conflict. It is devastating the Turkish economy. It is devastating the Turkish social fabric. It is devastating the regional stability and it is encouraging the rise of different forms of Islamism in the long run. If Islamism is a problem for the United States, if the United States would like to promote secularization and hopefully democratization and gender equality in the Middle East in the long run, I think the Kurds uh, in all of these countries are uh, wonderful allies, potential allies, not to divide up Turkey, not to divide up Syria, to turn these places more secular, more stable, and hopefully more democratic in the long run. I would like to stop here and uh, in the question and a session, uh, we can go into more specific and details. Thank you, Mehmet. Um, so to wrap this all up and sort of tie it all together. Um, so we know that, that, that Biden and his secretary of state pick Tony Blinken, they, they, have, a, a, they have a long history of, of showing a, a care and understanding of the Kurdish issue. So I, I guess what I just want to ask you guys is bottom line, do you, do you believe that, that 
the Biden administration will put this into practice or will they simply be glad handers, as Biden has oftentimes been accused of? And this is for anyone who wants to answer. I'm always happy to remain an optimist. Like, I mean, uh, the Trump administration didn't set the bar very high for uh, <laughs> what it will take to improve things. <laughs> Mehmet, Amy, no, no comment. We'll wait and see. I, I was waiting for Amy, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, as I try to lay out in my presentation, I believe that if the Biden administration appreciates, and I think they do, um, the complexity of the issue, and that this is not, again, limited to you know, a small corner of southeastern Turkey, but that it is an international problem and that solving it would therefore also have benefits internationally, uh, at least regionally within, within the Middle East. Not just Turkey would benefit from this, but also Syria, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Potentially, it could have an impact on the Kurdish region of Iran, but that's another issue I think that is too complicated to discuss right now. There were some Turkish economists that estimated already in 2016, that uh, the Turkish GDP could have been 14% uh, higher if Turkey had not engaged in this conflict with the PKK. So the Turkish economy lost 14, 14% of its GDP due to this conflict. And that was in 2016. That was before the last uh, three Turkish interventions in northern Syria. Um, and so... I don't know if any economists have calculated the expenses of these recent interventions in, in Syria for, for Turkey, but the, the costs are, are enormous for, for Turkey uh, domestically. Uh, but due to the autocratic nature of, of the regime now in, in Turkey, I don't think we can place a lot of hope, unfortunately, on um, you know, an impetus coming from from within Turkey. I mean, you have calls now from, from Bahçeli to disband and outlaw the HDP, which is a legal political party in Turkey, um, the second largest opposition party in Turkey. And so, you know, I think this is why we need to take leadership here in the United States and with our allies, as I suggested, it should be not just the United States, but, but a, a coalition of diverse stakeholders to to take on this issue. And I think the benefits could be enormous if, if we could make progress on in solving this. Thank you. I, comment, I also would like to, I also would like to remain uh, cautiously optimistic. Um, in the, in the short run, I think the Kurds uh, may be forgotten again here and there, but in the long run, one way or the other, they keep coming back. And the reason for that is the immense capacity for rebellion and statehood. I mean, not every ethnic or religious minority has that capacity. And it is both uh, a bliss and a curse at the same time. Because if the curse were just a small ethnic or religious group in some corner of some country, without a capacity to rebel and without a capacity for statehood, uh, they, they probably would not make the headlines uh, again and again and again. When you look at the number of the Kurdish rebellion in the last hundred years, I mean, I lost the count. Uh, there, are, there are at least 30 rebellions in Turkey alone. The PKK is just the, the last one. So, uh, and as, as they say, you know, the, you can trust the Americans to do the right thing after they try everything else. And I think we have reached to the point that America has tried everything else. So for that reason, I am uh, somewhat optimistic. And the Kurds do not ask Americans to fight their wars. The Kurds are not ask American troops to come and protect them. All the Kurds are asking for uh, a chance to actually build uh, something peaceful, something secular, something that would put them as an equal next to an Arab and next to a Turk and next to a Persian. So this is not, this, this is really a democratic demand. This is really a demand for 
uh, recognition uh, as a human being. And I think I, I have trust in American society and I still have trust in American state that uh, America one way or the other, uh, even that it has exhausted all other options, I'm hoping they will do the right thing. Let, let me just jump in there with a general thing here. Uh, let, let, let's, let, we need to understand the, the Turkish nationalism, uh, the Islamism, Arab nationalism have all developed in a context that is uh, pos positions them against uh, Western imperialism, colonialism. They're, 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 they've got elements of their DNA that's fundamentally anti-Western. That's not true in the Kurdish case. The Kurdish nationalism developed in opposition to the, the, the Turkish, Arab, <laughs> Persian nationalisms that were leaving no room for the existence of, of Kurds as, uh, as a group within those states. So America has strong natural Kurdish allies who that are, it's in its interest that they, they not be eliminated and, and that they remain on the scene. If that's the case, then, a Biden administration or a future Republican one, whatever the administration, they need to come up with general policies that increase the, the disincentives for these state actors like Turkey's Erdogan to invade uh, northern Syria or stay there. Needs, needs to make them pay a heavier price for that, while at the same time having carrots that allow them to shift their policies without being humiliated and, and in order to take advantage of the significant economic opportunities that, that Dr. Holmes has, has described so well, uh, so, so that we can get to a, a more virtuous cycle instead of the, the vicious circle going on where you know, we ignore the issue and they choose a militaristic solution and, and it just spirals out of control and, and, and we try to uh, engage in damage control after that. Thank you, David. Um, so we're ready to move on to the audience questions and answers now. I have a couple questions already. If any of you have any questions, we can also do uh, answer it live. First question here is for Amy. Um, and the, the person is wondering, can the United States and maybe the European Union play a role in bringing the Kurdish parties closer, giving Albright's initiative in 1998 between the KDP and the PUK, as an example. Uh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, the United States is already doing that with the Syrian Kurdish parties in, in Rojava. They're already part of these uh, unity talks that are happening between the PYD and the KNC or the NKC. And um, so, these talks have stalled for the moment in part because of the elections in the United States, in part because of, you know, travel that some of the members of those Syrian Kurdish parties were engaging in, but I believe they are planning to restart very soon. And so the U S could absolutely uh, play a part in trying to mediate these, um, these talks. And because I have to leave, uh, soon, I'll just insert, I guess, in the in the Q and A or in the chat box, links to two of my recent articles where I elaborated on some of the points that I made in my in my short presentation here. And I, I apologize for having to leave, but I had a the other uh, event was actually scheduled prior to this one, and so I I have to to leave soon um, in about four minutes. So I'm happy to take another question, but I'll, I'll post a couple links in the box in case people are interested in those. Sure. Amy, it's always great having you with us, by the way. Uh, Mehmet and David, do you have any comments on that question about the United States facilitating Kurdish unity? Uh, absolutely. Like, I mean, uh, they played an excellent role in the Washington Accords uh, in 1998. And uh, we have to remember that uh, at the same time as some regional states are, are intent on fomenting uh, divisions and strife between the Kurdish parties and using them against each other. Uh, it, it, the United States could play a role in, in, in counteracting that and, and fomenting a, a greater unity. Uh, it can offer all kinds of incentives for them to cooperate in productive ways. And this doesn't, this, uh, and I'm not saying, you know, work with the, uh, 
uh, various uh, Kurdish opposition groups to to secede from the states there. And I know that's not the U.S. policy uh, to encourage uh, changing uh, borders and so forth. But there there are productive avenues where the opposition has legitimate claims for more self-government within the states in which they reside. And, and the U.S. can play a role in bringing the uh, Iranian Kurdish groups uh, back uh, together more. The, the, the way, there's way too many splits amongst them. It can play a role in uh, reconciling uh, the various uh, Iraqi Kurdish opposition groups and, and the Syrian ones as well. Uh, that, that's the kind of thing the Biden administration should be good at. I, I would like to add on that, but I would like to uh, make an argument for that the so-called Kurdish divisions, I'm not really entirely convinced that the Kurds are necessarily more divided than uh, similarly situated ethno ethnic or religious groups. So when you look at the, um, the Kurdish divisions in Iraq or the Kurdish, the number of Kurdish parties in Syria or Turkey or in Iran, obviously, um, in some countries, the Kurds are more united or divided than the others. But nonetheless, the Kurds in Iraq, for instance, um, they are not as united as we would like them to be. Uh, there are some important divisions and there are some important differences, disagreements between them. But the Kurds in Iraq, empirically speaking, are no more divided than the Palestinians. Uh, when you look at the entire uh, list of similar ethnic and religious groups, uh, non-state groups who, who are seeking uh, self-determination in one form or another, for instance. The Kurds in Turkey are much more united than many other ethnic groups elsewhere. So that, that being said, and I think um, going back to the question, uh, when you have like 30 to 40 million people stretching from Western Iran to Eastern Mediterranean, uh, it is expected uh, to an extent to have different groups competing with one another. And on the one hand, we have the Syrian Democratic Forces. On the other hand, we have uh, the opposition groups supported by Barzani and the Kurdistan Regional Government or KDP. And I think without an American mediation, uh, the situation will get worse. We, we should also remember that uh, the, the foundation of the KRG were laid out by American mediation between uh, the PUK and KDP in the early 1990s. So it, it was American mediation that made it happen uh, to turn those two uh, different political parties as the cornerstone of the emerging Kurdistan regional government. Yes, and I think the American mediation is absolutely necessary here. Right. Thank you so much, Mehmet. And now Amy has left us, but we have about 20 more minutes for questions. Um, next question uh, and comment comes from Andrew Apostle. I'm going to uh, enable your mic, Andrew. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say uh, something that links this to Dr. Karim. Um, as you all know, internal Kurdish politics is famously cynical and rather harsh, I'm putting it mildly, and yet, um, and so are Kurdish dealings with Middle Eastern states, and yet when Kurds deal with Western states, they become rather doughy-eyed and regard things in rather rose-tinted ways and become a little naive. And I think one of the things that Dr. Kareem brought to this discussion, and it's tragic that he's no longer with us, was that he was able to counsel Kurdish leaders not to fall for the um, eyewash, frankly, coming from Western politicians. And I think a famous example of this was in 2010 when Biden and Obama tried to get to Jalal Talabani to resign as president of Iraq to allow Ayad Alawi to take over instead. And there was enormous pressure put on Jalal Talabani. And Dr. Karim, luckily for the Kurdish people of Iraq, was there and was able to say, don't fall for this. 
And I think that's going to be one of the big issues coming up, which is, as usual, the Americans and Western countries will promise all sorts of wonderful things in the future if only the Kurds make enormous sacrifices right now, e.g. Raqqa, Mambij, and all this kind of thing. Um, and of course, those wonderful promises never come to pass. And what's really going to be needed, I think, from the Kurdish perspective, is that kind of statesmanship that we had from Dr. Karim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I, I agree completely with what Andrew just said. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful comment. Thank you, Andrew. And it'd be hard to fill his shoes. Okay, the next question comes from Representative Bayan Rahman of the KRG. So good to have you with us, Representative Bayan. Um, her question is this. The U.S. has the Kurds on its side without having to deal with any of the issues the panelists have raised. What is the immediate, not long-term, overriding and compelling national security imperative for the Biden administration to act differently from previous administrations and deal with the Kurdish question in a holistic way? So if I understand correctly, uh, the, the question is, uh, what is the overriding national security imperative that the, in the region relating to the states that where Kurds are present that the Biden administration needs to address right now? Yeah, well, ha, um, which, um, over, which compelling national security imperative for the Biden administration to act differently from, previ <laughs> from previous administration? Yeah, differently. Oh, the, that, that's a hard one she's posed for. Yeah, that is, I know. But we yeah. have to answer it, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure the security imperatives change Ha, ha, the the lens through which they're viewed and 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 the strategies that one sees as as most productive for addressing those challenges changes with an administration, but it, it's still the same country dealing with uh, ISIS resurgence, dealing with Iran trying to expand its uh, influence and weight in the region and, and undermine. Uh, uh, U.S. interest there. Uh, the same challenge of uh, Turkey under Erdogan engaging in a lot of adventurism and supporting uh, proxy Islamist groups in many cases. Uh, those problems all stay the same. Now, how the U.S. addresses them under Biden can change uh, significantly if, so, if a Biden administration, for instance, believes more in multilateral action, uh, believes uh, more in not giving uh, uh, President Erdogan carte blanche to to do whatever he likes if he sweet talks him on the phone um, and, and uh, to engage with the Kurdish parties and listen to what they need. Like Dr. Gursas uh, stressed the, the fact that they need to listen. So, and, and I mentioned as well, they need to hold talks with the Iranian Kurdish uh, 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 opposition parties and, and they need to, to speak more with the KRG their needs more with the SDF and, and act accordingly. And that's why I also suggested that working groups be set up in the U.S. bureaucracy that are devoted to the Kurdish issue rather than always set up along state lines. And I would like to add to that. Um, I think it, it really depends on, this is an excellent question, also a tough one, I have to admit. Um, it really depends on our definitions of priorities in the Middle East. What does the Middle East uh, mean uh, to the United States? Um, and the threat perception, if Islamism as a political ideology is a national security threat, then I think um, the Kurds will have to be uh, talk to, will have to be partnered with in order to actually fight Islamism, at least in the Middle East. If the rise of an Iranian empire stretching from Tehran to Baghdad to Damascus to, uh, to Beirut, if it is uh, a threat to American uh, interest, then I think the Kurdish lens provides an excellent instrument for the United States to use to prevent the rise of an Iranian empire. If that happens, it would be, uh, Iran would be too powerful to deal with. Uh, 
It really all depends on how we define our benefits, how we define our uh, threat perception. Uh, but the I would like to add uh, something to, to this, uh, that my experiences, at least with my students at the university, uh, I generally see it is Middle East fatigue among Americans. And some of them are rightly so, uh, somewhat uh, getting tired of talking about the, the complexities of the Middle Eastern politics. And Middle Eastern politics is not really uh, as complicated as it has been portrayed in the media. It really depends on how you look at it. When it comes to the Kurdish lands, when it comes to the the need for working with the Kurdish groups in Syria or Iraq or Iran or Turkey, if we cherish certain values, certain notions such as democracy, such as secularization, such as human rights, I think we must be part of the Middle East. If, if Islamism is no longer a threat to us, if Iranian Islamic Republic of Iran, it does no longer pose a threat to American interest, then I think the United States should not uh, be there and just get out as soon as possible. But these two issues will determine American perception of the threat in the Middle East. And the reason I am cautiously optimistic, Joe Biden has enough experience and enough wisdom to actually see this and at least listen to the parties involved and come with some um, some compromise from different groups. Thank you. If I, um, if, if I, uh, go on. If I can piggyback Dr. Gerson's uh, statement about some things are, are sort of that people realize. Look, in 2017, if the U.S. had just you know pointed at uh, the, the the Kurds in Iraq and said, "Look, these guys are with us," don't attack. <laughs> That's pretty simple. And that's a logic that everyone has. At the same time, the U.S. had every right to say you know, we're not going to support a session track. That's not a policy, but you do stand by our allies. You understand this, the, the rain under in this cloud. And it looks like we've lost David. Hopefully you can. It says you and me, Philip, now. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we have a question for you, Mehmet, um, and that's from Urkaya. Akaya, sorry. Um, that's a good question, and it's one that, that I'm very interested in. Um, do you think it's realistic that the Biden administration will mediate between the PKK and the Turkish government? Um, I think, given what we have talked about, um, something Dr. Holmes mentioned during your presentation, that the economic cost of fighting uh, the Kurdish insurgency since the 1990s, not just in 2016, and let me just take it back to the, the 1990s, has been on average about 10% of the total GDP every year. This is a huge cost, a huge uh, pressure on the Turkish economy. And it's not a coincidence. Every single time the Turkish state intensifies the conflict with the Kurds or the Kurdish insurgency, the economy collapses. It collapsed in the 1990s. It collapsed after 2015. And the Turkish economy is in really a dire situation as of today. So, and one of the reasons why the ceasefire between the PKK and the Turkish government, the AKP, between 2013 and 2015 that failed, uh, the, uh, the lack of trust between the actors, and it is expected. When you have two groups that are fighting one another for 40 years, it's not really that easy to build trust. And when you look at similar uh, conflicts in Latin America to Africa to Asia, so the Kurdish conflict is not really unique in that sense. The Kurdish conflict is just another intrastate armed conflict that has been going on for too long and needs to be brought to a political solution. And in that political solution, you need a foreign external mediator that will actually build trust between the insurgents and the state until they can actually start 
talking to one another and agree on something. So uh, I'm hoping that the Biden administration will actually convince the Turkish government that the peace is uh, much better idea than the war for everyone in the Middle East. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have eight minutes left, folks. Um, I have a question for you guys, if, if, if I may. Um, there's a factor that I think is underrated here in that if we look back in uh, autumn of 2019, when, when Trump greenlit uh, Turkey's invasion of northern Syria, it elicited a, a public outcry amongst Americans and, and also bipartisan um, uh, a bipartisan sort of response uh, denouncing Trump's decision. Um, and this, this was unusual to me because the American public is very wary of American involvement anywhere. They're, they're tired of it. And, and this is sort of the era where sort of Tulsi Gabbard's unqualified sort of American isolationism, you know, ideologies is very popular. So given this, you could almost say that, that, that the Kurds do occupy a place in the American, you know, public imagination. The, the American household does discuss Kurdish issues. Um, what factor do you think this can play in, in future sort of American policy towards Kurds? And this is for both David and Mehmet. David, would you like to go first? Uh, you're on mute, David. Okay, <laughs> let, let, me, let me go first this time for a change. Okay. Um, I, I think you touched upon uh, an excellent point, something I, I wanted to cover in, in my uh, presentation, but somewhat, uh, somehow I, I forgot to, to mention that. Uh, briefly, I think uh, if, if soft power is about whose story is winning, then the Kurds, the Kurdish story is winning in the last five or six years. What the Kurds have created in Northern Syria, what the HDP of Turkey has accomplished in the last several years, and something you mentioned earlier, uh, this, the emphasis on gender equality, the emphasis on a secular political structure, the emphasis on an inclusive democratic political system. The Western audience is no longer seeing the Kurds as bandits, as it was the case 30 years ago during the Cold War here, for instance. So uh, I think the Kurdish story uh, has been gaining a lot of attention uh, in, in, among the Westerners. Uh, the thing is, this kind of things takes time to actually materialize. Uh, and let's hope that it's not gonna be too late for the Kurds until the soft power that the Kurds have created to turn into some concrete material outcomes. Yeah, great answer, Matthew. David? Yeah, I, I, in October 2019, uh, after President Trump got off the phone with Erdogan and essentially green-lighted that Turkish invasion, it was very depressing for a lot of people who care about human rights and, and was, they were witnessing what was happening there during that invasion with the proxy uh, Syrian, uh, mostly Islamist groups. But what was surprising and, and, and very gratifying was that the vast majority of Americans did not share President Trump's uh, exclusively transactional perspective of this, of, uh, oh, the Syrian Kurds aren't useful to us anymore, Turkey offers more. Instead, they, they viewed themselves as, as good guys still, and good guys don't betray an ally who did nothing wrong to them and, and only helped them fight uh, a mutual enemy like ISIS. And the bipartisan reaction, even, you know, Lindsey Graham and, and Mitch McConnell and, and others in Washington were like, this is wrong. And we had more resignations uh, from, from the, the Trump administration. And that was a remarkable moment, which, uh, which shows that the, the, the Kurdish stoicism of just trudging on no matter what and, and, and not... Um, uh, resorting to uh, s some of the uh, anti-American invective that some of the other groups uh, regularly resort to, even when they're getting much more assistance from the U.S. than the Kurds ever get, <laughs> uh, starts to pay off. 
Like, I mean, it, it starts to penetrate the surface. And I think the, the, the next American leader who's, who's thinking of acting similarly will only have to remember the bipartisan vehement reaction against Trump uh, for last year in October 2019. And I think that's a major achievement. And Turkey, uh, Erdogan's government may have won that battle in 2019, but uh, the, the larger narrative war, they most certainly lost. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I really need to emphasize that I, I do not recall a time since, you know, the early 2000s that the American public had such an opinion about an American foreign policy decision. So it's, you know, now I, I, I American policy on, on, on the Kurds, it comes under public scrutiny. And this is a unique situation. So, um, I believe we have time for, for one more question. Um, and this, this one comes from uh, Idris Sala. Um, we'll have to keep it kind of short. It's for, for you, Mehmet, and, and David, you're free to comment as well. So in 2005, Biden visited Iraq and he gave a statement to Congress and the Bush administration that Iraq must be divided into three states, one for Kurds and others for, for Sunnis and Shias. But during his eight years of vice presidency, he never mentioned or even forgot what he has said about one time about Iraq. So his question is this, why do we as a, a Kurd put too much optimism on Biden while we have such an experience with him or for Biden, there is a difference between Kurds and Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. So David and Mehmet, you, you can both answer this briefly. Well, I, I think Biden's plan that he uh, co-authored with uh, Brown, or I forget the other... Um, Gleb, was it? Was that his name? Ah, whatever. Right, the Biden back, or yeah. I forget the name. Well, whatever. The, it was around 2007. It didn't call for three states. It called for three regions within Iraq. And that was 100% in line with the Iraqi constitution of 2005, which uh, explicitly has provisions to create more regions within <clears throat> Iraq other than just Kurdistan. And in fact, federalism in Iraq cannot function properly if Kurdistan is the only region. There's supposed to be another house of parliament made up of the regions that, that plays a role in policy making. And, and if Kurdistan's the only region, then you've set yourself up for a uh, binary conflict, always between Kurdistan and the Baghdad federal government. Whereas if there's Sunni and Shiite regions too, you can have cross-sectarian alliances of common interest vis-a-vis uh, -vis the federal government. I, I, I'm from Canada. I, I guess I know this, right? I'm from Quebec. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> Quebec agrees with other provinces against the federal government. Sometimes it doesn't. And, and that, that's the nature of federalism. And, and I thought Biden's plan was along those lines. Now, he had the misfortune of describing it in sectarian terms. What he should have said was other regions, geographical, based on geographical realities or otherwise. But uh, he was in no position to enact that, though. So I don't see that as a broken promise of Biden. Mehmet, any comments? Yeah, I mean, uh, federalism or decentralized power is a wonderful thing. If it was such a bad thing, Canada or United States wouldn't have it, right? I mean, apparently mm -hmm. this is something we approve of, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. Uh, but then again, I, I would like to clarify something and I thank for the, for the, the question. Uh, I'm not really uh, overly optimistic or too optimistic about the Biden administration. That's what I meant by there are limits to the Biden administration's ability to conduct things differently in the Middle East, because uh, there are some structural limits. There are some political limitations that uh, the Biden administration may not be able to overcome in only four years. Uh, but what the Biden administration uh, could do, and I think they will, uh, as long as they do not embrace the Turkish government the way President Trump did, as long as they prevent another Turkish military intervention into Syria, uh, the Kurds are capable enough to take care of themselves one way or the other. So uh, the, the Biden administration biggest contribution to the Kurdish um, cause or the Kurdish groups in 
different places in the Middle East, including Iran. And some of the questions, rightly so, are asking about how come we are not really uh, talking about Iran as much as we should have. It's not that we don't want to talk about Iran. It's just the way I would like to see it. The Iranian Kurdish question seems to be a reflection of the Kurdish questions in other parts of the Middle East, or they are very much related to one another. So without solving the Kurdish question in Turkey or Syria or Iraq, uh, we cannot solve the Kurdish question elsewhere either. So as long as the Biden administration uh, keeps the stability, the time is on the Kurdish side. If, if you give the Syrian democratic forces another 10 years, the way things are, if you keep the status quo for another 10 years, you got yourself a new generation speaking Kurdish, educated in Kurdish and, and socialized differently and pol politically and socially uh, trained differently. So as long as the Biden administration keeps it stable, under control, the Kurds will have a much better chance in the long run to actually make a much stronger case later. All right, great. Thank you, Mehmet. Well, that about concludes our session today. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And I would like to thank Mehmet, David, and Amy for joining us. This was a wonderful discussion. As always, we hope we'll see you next time. I wish you all a wonderful holiday. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you next year. Take care, everybody. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Philip. Thank you.